Thank you, Brother Will. We appreciate you. I uh, appreciate the work that you are doing over there at Alpha. We are absolutely, unashamedly pro-life. We are pro-mothers, and we are pro-Jesus. Uh, that is our church, and we, uh, we really love the work that you do. We're thankful for that. It's funny, I was in the green room right now, and the worship team, I won't tell you who, Maddie, said you should go out there five minutes late and bring a coffee. But I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that to you. So, But if you didn't like that joke, talk to Maddie. Uh, so on your seats, some of you, this morning, the seat in front of you, you see we have this QR code. And this is our new digital connection card. Our goal and our hope for this, and this is so like important in this service especially, is to better connect with you. There are a lot of people where we, we don't have any information on you. I tried to call and follow up with someone last week. Name wasn't in the system, and we, we ended up kind of playing phone tag with a bunch of people till we could finally trace down their number so I could text them, hey, how you doing? You know what I mean? Uh, we want to connect with you. So for our first time guests, absolutely. But even for those of you who have been coming for a while and you haven't stopped at the welcome desk or filled out the card or whatever, pull out your phone, take a snap of that, uh, of that QR code. You can fill it out real quick. You could use it for prayer requests as well. Let me tell you another reason uh, this is kind of important. This week, we're sending out the annual tax statements, the giving receipts, and we're emailing them out this year. And if we don't have your proper email, you won't get it. So if we don't have your proper email, and you'll know if we do because you get stuff from us, if we don't have it, please make sure to do that. Also, as it pertains to giving receipts, if you would prefer your paper receipt like usual, not a problem, just contact the church office, and we will go ahead and get that to you, okay? So we've hit everything. We got alpha pregnancy, banana bread, late joke, QR codes, we're golden. Who likes banana bread, anyone? Who, who makes really good banana bread? What's up? <laughs> what the heck? I saw that hand. Let's, hook me up, Zaina. jeesh. All right, praise the Lord. So speaking of giving receipts, this morning we're gonna start a little series talking about giving, talking about the generous path, understanding the why, the when, and the where of giving. Now, we are not preaching this because we're taking a special offering. There's any new projects going on. Uh, we're doing great as a church, and we'll, we'll share about that at our annual business meeting. But we are talking about this because this is spiritual. This is spiritual. You could relax, you could put your wallet back in your pocket, the ushers are not coming forward. This is super spiritual. Um, thoughts about money and attitudes and philosophies about stuff destroy marriages, destroys families, it destroys friendships, and it hurts people's faith. You, you have to take my word for it. This is spiritual. Did you know in the word of God, it has more to say about finances than it does about heaven and hell combined? Let, let that soak in there. The word of God talks more about finances than it does heaven and hell combined. Why? Because this is important stuff. This is important stuff, and I, I love the topic. I'm not going to lie to you. I like the topic of giving, and I hate the way so many have presented giving in, in the church in, in America and modern day. I hate the, uh, the manipulation and the tactics and the, the twisting of Scripture to try to motivate people to give more. It drives me crazy. If you've been at this church for any length of time and you've thought to yourself, oh, our church doesn't really do that. That's why. It's awful. It drives your pastor nuts. In fact, when other churches do it, it hurts us because then you try to tell your friend about Jesus and they think, oh, you're one of those churches who's only after the money or something. So understand when, when other churches or ministries do this wrong, it hurts us. 
I can get passionate about this. I get angry about this. Talk about how churches manipulate the word of God to get people to give more. Oh my gosh, that's brutal. That's brutal. That doesn't honor God. It doesn't help the person. And if I read scripture correctly, and I do, uh, those people are seven times more accountable for, for what they're teaching. Uh, scripture talks about those who teach being more accountable. So, ooh, bad stuff. Uh, I heard a story of a man who was, uh, I don't know if it was a television or a radio thing, but it was a Christian ministry that was doing a fundraising thing. And they were doing, uh, I don't want to say the typical, because it's not typical here, but those, those typical verses that if you give, God's going to bless you right back. And, and a lot of these other things to manipulate people into giving, to maybe guilt them into giving. And the part that was so offensive, it wasn't even just the bad teaching from a church, because that's pretty offensive for me. Even worse than that, a bunch of people just gave. The the discernment in the body of Christ. It's not where it needs to be. Our knowledge on what God's word teaches on this, maybe it just isn't where it needs to be. Maybe that's why pastors, churches, ministries get away with teaching garbage because we don't know the word like we should. So I have two purposes for this sermon series and both of them, one of them will hit you. One, we want to talk about the importance of a generous heart and how giving is a part of that, and we want to develop that heart to be more like Jesus. Two, I don't want you to be manipulated in your giving, so if you're like, I'm not giving nothing, you're going to enjoy part of this sermon too, because I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't give, okay? So whether you're generous or you're not, you'll enjoy the sermon. It'll, it'll help you on either end. Knowing what God's word teaches is absolutely critical, and because of the impact, listen, are we going to sit here and pretend finances don't play a role in life? Like you live on some cloud, like you're on some other planet, and nobody cares. It does. It, it matters. It matters, and it impacts us, and it impacts our family, it causes a lot of stress in marriage. Uh, could hurt our future, young people. You, you could make decisions in high school, college, that hurts you for decades. Like, there's a lot here. We, we want to know what God's word says. We want to do it right, and we want to make sure that our heart is where God wants our heart to be. That makes this spiritual. And we've been talking for the last couple weeks about having our best year ever. This is part of it. Get, getting our head wrapped around what God says about our finances and such, this is part of it so we can be everything that God wants us to be so we can do everything that God wants us to do. Our series verse comes out of Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32 says this, it says, but a generous man devises generous things and by generosity he shall stand. I'm very generous with that word, generous. Uh, a generous man devises generous things, and by his generosity, he shall stand. We really want to focus on how God wants our heart. God doesn't want something from you. How many of you here know this morning there is nothing that you own or possess that God wants? Nothing. God is not in heaven looking at you and your new vehicle, thinking, man, I wish I had one. <laughs> Do you know that? Do you understand that there's nothing that you own that God has any use for, right? Okay, so God is not after your stuff. God, however, is passionately after your heart. God does want your heart. And when we start talking about money, finances, people start to get uncomfortable, we start to realize through the lens of scripture, this is a heart thing. It's not just a money thing. This is a heart thing. Where is my heart? And Jesus talks about this quite a bit. God wants us to be generous. So one of the most important lessons when it comes to giving, when it comes to developing generosity, has to do with motivations. And I want to talk about motivations, the why of giving this morning. And the reason that you give 
is more important than what you give. Let me tell you that again. The reason, the heart behind why you give is more important than the amount, spiritually speaking. Spiritually, the amount is whatever, but your heart is everything. And why we give matters. In 1 Corinthians 13.3, Paul talks about this. He talks about the motivation behind the gift being more important than the gift. 1 Corinthians 13.3, this is the love chapter, right? You know, love, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not be mean to people. You know the verses, right? You hear it at every wedding. Before that, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, And though I bestow all my goods, all my goods, to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, I think it's interesting here. Paul is not making up ridiculous examples. We read in the book of Acts, people were selling everything that they had and laying it at the disciples' feet. We also know through history, Christians have been burned at the stake. So what we read today is like, oh, he's using, he's using that you know, excessive language to drive home a point. This was happening in Paul's days. Paul knew people who gave everything and he knew people who were burned for their faith. And Paul says, even if I gave everything and I was burned at the stake, if I don't have love, it doesn't help me at all. The point, the motivation is superior to the action. The heart behind it. And we know this from all of scripture. We know this from everything that Jesus taught. He would go through the, the Ten Commandments and then he would add to it. He, he would expound on it, I should say. Where he would say, you've heard it was said, do not steal, but I tell you, you know, do not take anything from your neighbor. Do not commit adultery, but don't even look at a woman to lust after her. Love your enemy, but I tell you, bless those who curse you. And Jesus would take everything that looked like, okay, we gotta follow this. He'd say, no, 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 this is a heart thing. You got to make sure your heart is right. So the motivations of giving, why we give, why we do what we do are very important in the faith. Let's talk about some wrong motivations. There's a lot of teaching out in the world today. Um, call it the prosperity gospel. Call it like a prosperity light gospel. Less filling still tastes great. Uh, it, this idea that if you give, God will bless you. Period. They, they don't tell you how he's going to bless you. They kind of leave it out there. You give 10 bucks, God's going to give you 100. I can't start using the voice. Don't use the voice. Don't use the voice. Got it. Okay. So th this idea, this idea that giving to God is an investment strategy. Like, yeah, I got my 401k and I'm, you know, active in the market and I give to church and, you know, we're getting 8% here and four here and God's giving back 40%. So that... Giving to the Lord is not an investment strategy. God does not promise you money. If you gave to the offering today with the expectation you're going to get back 10 times, you might not. <laughs> In fact, you might get back zero times. In fact, we may use it to pay a heat bill. You're not even going to feel spiritual about it, okay? Because it's not about the money, it's about the heart and why we give. And does God bless us when we honor him? Well, yeah. Like every area of our life, God blesses us. Does God promise to bless us with money when we give money? No. No. But people will teach that. Because you can find one verse out of scripture that tells you just about anything. Well, you know, David saw a naked woman from his rooftop, so I'm on the roof with binoculars. What's the big deal, Pastor? <laughs> you could twist the Bible to say whatever you want it to say, and people do, and churches do, and ministries do, and we get a bad name because of how other ministries talk about money and deal with money. And that's no good. That prosperity gospel that you give to this ministry and you're going to be rich and wealthy, all of the saints of the Bible would disagree with that. In the New Testament, they would kick you out of the church if you taught that. And there was only one church. 
it wasn't like you can go to the other one. There was only one. They would kick you out of it. In the Old Testament, they would just kill you. So (laughs) Old Testament was a little harsher. We know that, all right? There is no saint of God who would agree with any of what that doctrine teaches. That is a wrong motivation for giving. If we give to get, that's greed. That's greed. How many of you know the Bible doesn't promote greed, right? Like Bible's not a fan. Good. Okay. Four of you. Four of you know that the Bible is anti-greed. Should I be concerned? Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Giving to get, the motivation is greed. God's not about that. Giving because you feel pressured. Manipulation. I heard someone say it. You you put on a sob story. You have to give because if you don't, the children in Africa will starve and die. And and, and listen, I've heard those appeals before and I'm like, I don't care if it's guilt or not. I'm giving because I feel awful. (laughs) You feel like a sinner for not giving. How many of you know God is not honored with your manipulation, right? God doesn't invite you to the cross to manipulate you into doing something. That's not it. Greed is a terrible motivation. Manipulation is a terrible motivation. Now listen, church, there's, there will be needs that you will hear about and they will touch your heart and you will want to do something. That, that's normal to the human experience. And as, as Christians, we're, we're called to do things when we can, when God puts it on our heart. Can we financially or practically fix every world problem? No. Should you walk around feeling guilty because you can't fix every... I don't. I don't. Maybe I'm a bad person. No. But when God, when God gives me the opportunity and there's something that I can do and, and, and I feel God's... Lead, yeah, we give. That's not manipulation. Okay? B- being made aware of a need isn't manipulation. But that digging it in and turning the knife and really pouring it... Ah, too much. Too much. Greed's a bad motivation. Manipulation is a bad motivation. You know what else is a bad motivation? Recognition. I'll give, but I want to make sure other people see it and know it. And I could, you know, take some credit for it. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6. He talks about the religious leaders who made a show of their giving so other people would recognize them. And it, that Jesus says of them, they have the reward. Don't expect anything from God. You have your reward there. But what are the right motivations? What are some proper motivations when it comes to giving? We know scripture tells us God loves uh, what kind of giver? Cheerful. Cheerful. When you dropped your offering in the buckets and back, did you give it a little, ha, 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 right? Just a little holy giggle because you're a cheerful giver, right? I think that's, that's not how it works. Okay. Cheerfulness, a heart thing. How do we get there? How do we get from where we are today, our reluctant giver, a stingy giver, a very stressed out giver. How do we get to cheerful? How does God want to move us from where we are to developing a generous heart? And we're going to see that a a part of that is going to be learning to trust God completely, completely. That's part of how we get there. So let's talk about some right motivations. I got four right motivations for giving today. First one is this, giving as worship. Let's view giving as worship to God. That means there's a priority to it. There's a certain importance to it because we're not giving for human reasons. We're giving it unto the Lord. I want to share two verses with you. And I want to connect them because it's interesting. Both, both of these are words of Jesus. The first one's Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, the, the devil is tempting Jesus out in the wilderness. Every time the devil tempts Jesus, Jesus refutes it with scripture. Matthew 4.10, Satan offers him everything, all the things, all the stuff, if you'll bow down and worship me. Matthew 4.10, Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The word serve there is the word I want you to think about. Now we fast forward, and in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus is talking again about money. Oh, Jesus, all he ever talks about is money. 
He's talking about finances, and this is what he says, and, and pay attention to the word serve again here. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or for you King Jamesers, God and mammon, or for people who just like to say mammon because it's fun. You can't serve God and money. And I started thinking about that word serve because Jesus used it with, with the devil in the context of, I don't want all your stuff because my worship and my devotion are to God alone. He is the only one that I am going to serve. And when Jesus talks about money, he uses the exact same language. He says, you can't serve both. One is going to get your best, and the other is going to take the leftovers. Is going to get whatever is, you know, whatever. One gets the best. Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. That same mindset applies when it comes to our finances. Jesus connects these two because it's important for us to realize, to understand, what are we serving? There are different things that are a part of our life. There's a lot of things that are a part of our life. But what are we serving? Who are we serving? How are we serving? Worship as priority says God is first place. The, the first commandment, you'll have no other gods before me. Giving as worship tells us, God, you are number one, period. Period, and there's no question about it. So here's the question now that I would ask you, and this is personal. This is something you ask for yourself. What does your giving say about your worship? Soak it in. Let it sting. That's okay. What does your giving say about your worship? Does it say, God, you are number one, and I honor you with everything that I have? Or does it say, service was okay, worship was a little loud, my coffee was good but a little strong, Here's a little something for the effort. What does your giving say? Are you tipping God for good service? You're like, oh, God, it was pretty good. You entered a prayer this week. Here's, here's a little something. Don't spend it all in one place. Or is our giving worship to God? Now, can we ever give God what he deserves financially? No. You give him everything. You're still short, buddy. <laughs> he gave God everything you own, possess, had, ever will have. You go into debt to take out loans to pay God. We still can't give him enough. There is nothing, there is no amount you could ever give that pays for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Amen? Amen. Right? He gave because he loved us. That was his motivation. And we give because we love him. So the first Proper motivation for giving is giving isn't manipulation, it isn't greed, it isn't recognition and self-promotion. Giving is worship to God. Second motivation, we give as a matter of obedience. So Jesus said it like this, if you love me, keep my commands. Super easy, super simple, if you love me, do what I say. Jesus gives us commands. His word gives us commands. The Old Testament, the New Testament gives us commands about giving and what our attitude should be towards giving and generosity. All of that is in the scripture. But before I even give you that, obedience is kind of a big part of the thing, like the faith thing that we do. Like the whole Jesus thing. Obedience is kind of a big part. It's hard to have faith without obedience. And I know some of you are looking for like a disclaimer clause in your faith contract. You're like, Jesus, I have signed up for the forgiveness and the heaven package, but that do everything you say clause, like I, I've whited that out, do some of the things you say, <laughs> do most of the things you say. When we talk about obedience as believers, doing what God says 
kind of a non-negotiable? Fair? Like if God says, thou shalt not, we shalt not, not we, we don't, <laughs> right? Like obedience, this, this isn't hard. God's like, thou shalt not murder. Well, lucky for you. I was feeling murderous this morning. I don't know what tomorrow's gonna hold. We got a big game tonight. Who knows? Who knows? If God's word says don't do it, we don't do it. This is simple obedience. We don't get to negotiate this with God. God's like, love your neighbor. And like, huh, well, God clearly didn't know my one neighbor. He did. And he says, love your neighbor. And God says, forgive others. Like, well, he didn't mean, you know, my ex because, oh, he's a piece of... No, he did because he wrote it and he knows everything. So, like, there's no disclaimers or waivers or ways around this. In the faith, we obey God because he's God. And I'm not and you're not. And we do what he says as an act of love and as an act of worship and as an act of obedience to God. In Proverbs 3.9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. It talks about when it comes to finances, and this is, again, Old Testament, New Testament all over. We honor God with everything, with everything we have. And why do we do it? Well, we do it to worship him, that's good. We also do it to be obedient. And listen, on the topic of obedience, there are a lot of things in the word of God that it calls us to do that if the word of God did not call us to do it, I don't know about you, I wouldn't do it. There are a lot of commands in scripture about how to treat people. And if God didn't say, this is how you treat people, I don't know, maybe you're just a better human than me, which is fair. I wouldn't do those things if I wasn't following Jesus. But as a follower of Jesus, I'm going to obey what his word tells us to do when it comes to how we treat people, when it comes to my marriage, when it comes to my children, when it comes to my work, when it comes to my play, when it comes to my finances. There's things in God's word that sinful Steve... That should be a character, right? <laughs> We'd enjoy that little emoji too much. Sinful Steve, just put that on there. Listen, there's things we wouldn't do if God's word didn't tell us to do it. But because it does, we obey. And we do this already in hopefully every area of life because we don't get to pick and choose when we're obedient to Jesus. It's the same thing when it comes to to finances. Worship is a good motivation. Obedience is a great motivation. Third one, we give because we are thankful. We give because God has given us so ridiculously much over and over, and he still gives and he continues to bless. In 1 Chronicles 29, King David is preparing to build the temple. And God says, I don't want you to build it. Let your son build it, but you can get everything ready. So he's getting everything ready. He's gathering all the supplies, the workers, all the money that's necessary. More money is coming in than they know what to do with. There's a certain point where they tell people to stop giving in the Old Testament because they gave so much. They're like, no, 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 stop. We're good. Okay. 1 Chronicles 29.10, David is praying a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And I want to I wanna share this with you. I really want to highlight one verse. Starting in verse 10, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. All that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. That's a really good mindset for the follower of Jesus to, to hang on to. Both riches and honor come from you, 
You reign over all. Your hand is power and might. Your hand, it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. Now, hold on before we do verse 14. David is giving thanks to God for everything because he recognizes first and foremost, it's all yours, God. Everything belongs to you. All the glory and honor and power and victory and strength and increase, it's all yours. A fundamental principle in developing a generous heart is remembering everything is God's. Not 10%, not 5%, 8%, everything. Everything is God's. And God is gracious and generous with us. And he says here, he talks about how it's in your hand to give power and might. Your hand is to make great and give strength to all. Everything that you have is because of God's blessing in your life. All of it. And I know some of you here are thinking, but I worked hard. I worked hard and I saved. I made good financial decisions. All of those things may be true, but who gave you breath? Who gave you strength? Who gave you a mind that could think? For most of you here today, what did you do to be born in this free country where you can earn money and get ahead and build wealth? What did you do to be born in America? Why weren't you born in Ethiopia? You did nothing. But the blessing of God on our life is abundant. My ability to preach, God gives me the strength. Your ability to work, it's God who gives you the strength. Open doors and blessings that come that way, it's God who brings them. You want to know a terrifying thought? Your life without the hand of God on it. My life without the hand of God, that's terrifying. My finances, your finances, without the hand of God blessing you. Terrifying. Everything we have is because of God. David starts with that. He doesn't end there, though. He goes on. He gives thanks to God for everything. And in verse 14, he he phrases it like this. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? They were just giving so generously. David says, who are we that we would be so blessed that we're able to give this way. God, what did we do that we deserve such tremendous blessing? American, what did you do to deserve such a tremendous blessing from God to be able to even have the ability to give? And at the end, David says, for all things come from you and of your own we have given you. I got a great illustration for that. So if you have kids, or you have young kids, or at least they used to be young, do you remember for Father's Day you would give them money so they could buy you a gift? Right? Okay, all right. So so you're... So you're like, oh, here's, here's $20, okay. You're, you know, your wife would give them $20. Go buy, go buy dad a gift, and then they would come with some weird gift, and they would probably keep the change. I don't know. Kids are sketchy. Uh, give you like a handmade card, pocket the money. I don't know, whatever. And they would come back with this gift, and you're thankful because, oh, thanks. I didn't even own any socks. That's amazing. It's a tie. Oh, who'd have thought? Okay. And, you know, we're happy. Oh, thanks. That's the best. And you know in your heart, like, that was totally my money, but whatever. Um, This is kind of what David says at the end of this passage. He says, we're giving God back to him what he's already given us like we're doing something special. We're not. God is special. God is awesome. God is amazing. And he gives and he blesses us. And we're just giving you back what you already gave us. David gets this mindset. And now here's the thing with David. Filthy rich. (laughs) David, like crazy rich. He's the king of Israel, dude. Like, 
There was nothing he wanted that he didn't get. There was some stuff he wanted he shouldn't have got. He got. Okay? David did not have money problems. He had problems. <laughs> money was not one of them. 99 problems. No. So David had issues. Okay? And the idea here, David understood that all of his blessings came from God. Believer, we got to get there. We, we just... If you want to develop a generous mindset in your life, you've got to realize that everything you have is because you've got a Father in heaven who loves you and who has provided for you, who has watched over you. He watched over you when you were being stupid. When you were making bad decisions, he was still watching over you. And he's giving you strength, and he's giving you a brain, and he's giving you people around. Like, and, and David gets this. David's not sitting on the throne like, look at me. He's sitting on the throne saying, look at God. Look what God has done. It's all his, and we're just giving back to him. What, what's his? Like, like the child buying the gift. We're just giving back what's his. David understood thankfulness. David understood the goodness of God. If we can't learn to be thankful, and this isn't just like a November message, right? This is something every day in the life of the follower of Jesus. If we can't learn to be thankful, if we don't practice thanksgiving, we become ungrateful. We start to complain. Have you ever complained about your excess? Newsflash, you have. We all have. You complained about your iPhone 14 because the 15 came out, right? <laughs> You complained about your three-year-old car because the, four -year the, the new car has another button I could press and it, I don't know, makes unicorns appear, whatever. <laughs> We're so ridiculously blessed. If we don't understand and get this be thankful part, it's real easy if we start to become ungrateful. And then the other thing that starts to pile on there, especially because we're so blessed, discontentment. Now we'll start comparing. Well, it's good, but look at them and what they have. Oh, and we're not content. And the Bible tells us godliness with contentment is great gain. The Bible tells us the pursuit of wealth is a trap and it will shipwreck your faith. And we're like, yeah, but not mine. I'll be good. The Bible talks about this a lot to prevent ungratefulness because you have been blessed. To prevent discontentment and to develop that generous heart we need to remember and learn to be thankful and give God the praise and the glory for who he is, for all he's done, and how he has blessed you, which is more than we deserve. Amen? So much more than we deserve. I'll ask the worship team to come up, and I'm going to give you one more, one more part. Last reason that we give. Talk about giving to develop a generous heart. See, that's what we started the series with, being generous and one of the reasons that we can give is so we can start to develop that generous heart. We got some gym rats in here today, right? Gym rats, we still use that terminology. We so love to pump that iron, get in the gym all the time, body by Cheetos right here, okay? So uh, we got some gym rats among us, or, or CrossFit, because you can't do CrossFit without telling people. So if, if you're a CrossFitter, we already know, because you've told us all, everywhere. We know. So this idea of generosity is a lot like developing a muscle. Now, you can go and you can read a book on how to do arm curls. Be like, yeah, mm, feel the burn, baby. And you read the book cover to cover, and you know it. Like, yes, that is the proper form and technique, and this is the weight I should start with, and this is how many reps I should bang out, and I should have rest days, and you just figure the whole thing out. And then after that, you're like, no, that's not enough. Wait, I'm going to watch some videos on it. And you go, and you watch the you click on Instagram, and got your favorite fitness influencer, and you're watching him, and you're looking, you're like, man, oh, look at the guns, dude. Uh, and you're looking, you're like, not so much. Woo woefully short. Uh, and I want you to know, you can read every book that there is on the topic. You could watch every video that there is. But until you start lifting a weight, it's not going to do anything for you, is it? You're going to know a lot, 
It's not going to change anything. You could go next level. You could go to the gym, show up at Planet Fitness, pop a seat right on the bench next to the dude with the 45s, and he's, and just watch and be like, ripped. Whew, that man is shredded. What an absolute specimen of a human being. You could find out his workout schedule and you could go watch him every time he works out. You may get kicked out for that. I don't know. <laughs> but at no point in your reading or watching videos or even sitting right next to someone else doing it, at no point are your muscles going to develop until you pick up some weights and start doing it. Do you know how to develop a generous heart? Start doing it. Yeah. That's, that is literally the only way. This sermon ain't going to do it. <laughs> All right? Go listen to another sermon. Still not going to do it. Read a book. Not going to do it. Come to the annual business meeting and hear about all the people who have given to the church this year and how much came in and how much went to missions. And it's impressive. Still isn't going to change a thing for you. Nothing's going to change till you start working your generous muscles. It's probably more like this, right? It's a different exercise. <laughs> write the check. Until you start giving, until you start being generous, you won't develop that heart. And for those of you who have been here, I do this with every time we talk about giving. You don't have to give here to develop this generous muscle. This isn't church wants your money. This isn't God wants anything from you. Give it all to Alpha. Will's here today. He gets the benefit of this sermon. Okay? Give it all to Alpha Pregnancy and, and help, help that ministry. This isn't about God wants something from you. This is God has something for you. He has a heart that is not distracted by the stress of this world. You could have peace. Your marriage, you don't have to be fighting about money all the time. I want you to know, I am not rich. I have no financial stress. And it's not because my bank account is huge. That's not the reason. I have no financial stress because I honor God with everything to the best of my ability and I don't worry about it because it's his. That's it. And I want you to know this morning, that can be you. It's not like a special gift for a pastor. You don't have to carry that stress because once we understand this is all God's and I'm going to honor him with everything and I'm going to worship him and I'm going to obey him and I'm going to be thankful for what I have and whatever God does is good and I'm going to trust him with it, you could have peace. Peace is huge. Peace in your marriage is huge. Finances rip people apart. They rip relationships apart. You don't have to have that. God wants you, you, to develop a generous heart. Maybe you're already a little generous. Get ripped. Get shredded. <laughs> Maybe you're still convinced that someone is after your stuff. You got that death grip on your wallet right now. You're like, you're not getting a penny. I leave my wallet in the car when I come to church just in case you preach this. <laughs> you can give online. We're good. Just take out your phone. Uh, listen, God wants something for you. And until you get that, be careful. Because the call, and young person, I want you to hear this, and adults, you already know you're living in the friction. Jesus said you can only serve two masters. This world will push you to serve money and success and wealth. And God is going to say, serve me only. And those two things are going to rub together in your life. And the sooner you pick God, the easier it gets. Otherwise, that friction, your whole life, most of the stress that people have with finances, Christian people, is that friction. Who am I going to serve? Who am I going to serve? So we give as worship. We give out of obedience. We give because we're thankful. And we give to develop a generous heart. Church, God has blessed us so much. Let 
how we give and let the, the generosity that is developed in our hearts be a good reflection of everything that God has done for us. Would you bow your heads with me as we close this morning? I'm going to ask our altar team if they would come. Like I said, no special offering, no special projects. That's not the motivation here this morning. I want you to see giving as worship, but more than that, I want you to see that this is spiritual, that God is is wanting to get your attention for your growth and for your benefit so you can be more like him. So learning to understand that and, and grab onto that, this is for your growth, this is for your family, for your marriage, it's, this is for you, this is good, this is healthy. As we close the service this morning, we close it like we always do. Our team will come and sing a closing song. And this altar is open for prayer. And I know some of you came in this morning with some heavy needs and they had nothing to do with money or generosity. But I want you to know our God is incredibly generous with grace and strength and forgiveness and healing and everything that we need. And, and this altar is open this morning. If you need prayer for something, there's some couples and people up here who would love to pray with you. Uh, I, I invite you to take, take this opportunity. Maybe you just need to press in with God. Best year ever. 2024, best year ever. God, you're going to change things this year. More souls are going to come to you this year. God, I'm going to go deeper with you this year. I'm going to be more committed to your word this year. More committed to prayer, to the fellowship. God, I'm going to be more generous this year. It all links back. Best year ever. If that's you this morning, you need to make that commitment again. Maybe you just want to seek God and spend some time in his presence as the team joins us for this final song. Just encourage you, get out of your seat. Let's spend some time with Jesus as we close. Would you stand together with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you that you don't just tell us about generosity. You are generous. God, you are generous with your love and your grace for your children. God, you are generous with your patience and long-suffering towards us because, God, we're just a mess sometimes. And Lord, you give us strength each and every day. And Lord, you've blessed us so much more than we deserve. Let us say like David, everything we have is yours. God, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory and the majesty. It is all yours, God. You're the one who lifts up and you're the one who gives strength to our hands and you're the one who brings riches and honor. God, it's all yours. And we thank you for the many blessings that we've received from your hands. Lord, I pray for those with needs this morning, those committing just to be closer to you. God, get a hold of hearts. That's the only thing you want from us, Jesus. You want our hearts. Father, get a hold of our hearts through your word, through your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's respond to God this morning. God, there's nobody